I've been listening to Cats, and I have some thoughts. Before we can get into those, though, I need to give a content warning for racism, misogyny, and references to homophobia, Nazis, injury, death, and alcohol. So it's not exactly news that Growl Tiger's Last Stand is racist. I mean, the song has a slur in it. If you heard that and thought it was okay, there's no helping you. The thing is, I think a lot of people fixate on the slur and miss the much more insidious racism underneath. They also miss a valuable case study. A lot of white people, myself included, are reluctant to make any kind of judgement call when it comes to racism because we don't want to mess up. The intent is good, but I think it's misguided. There is no opting out of engaging with racism just because you're white. We're not only surrounded by it, but we're the ones responsible for perpetuating it. Growl Tiger's Last Stand is going to help us with that, because it isn't subtle. It's insidious, but it isn't subtle. The racial stereotypes are unabashed, and a lot of the racism is also fairly generic, relying on othering rather than stereotypes, so the chances of messing up are fairly low. It's a good training ground to develop and to practice some critical thinking skills that can help us, as white people, identify racism because it isn't fair or reasonable to put that burden solely on black, brown, indigenous people of colour. It's also a good opportunity to learn how the art we consume can perpetuate racist ideas and even teach us to be racist without us noticing. If you haven't listened to Growl Tiger's Last Stand, I would highly recommend listening to it now. I've linked the specific version I want to discuss, the original London cast's recording, in the video description below. So, the story of Growl Tiger's Last Stand is pretty simple. We have a pirate, Growl Tiger, who terrorises England. Then, a large group of Siamese cats kill him while he's distracted by his lover, Griddlebo. That's it. That's the whole story. The substance of the story comes from its rich characterization, not its narrative. That's why it's very worrying that the Siamese cats, despite being present throughout the story, don't get any characterization. We get some description of their weapons and their ships are identified as specifically sampans and junks, but we don't get anything beyond that. The only other detail we're told is in this line. The Siamese cats have bright blue eyes, all of them as a group. At least in Western fiction, eyes tend to be used to give characters individuality, but in this instance, they're used to indicate that the Siamese cats are interchangeable and homogenous. The Siamese cats are never treated as individuals at any point throughout the story. You may be tempted to argue that there just isn't enough time for the Siamese cats to be explored as individuals, but that isn't true. Listen to how Growl Tiger's victims are described. They would fortify the hen house, lock up the silly goose. When the rumor ran along the shore, Growl Tiger's on the loose. Woe to the weak canary that flutters from its cage. Woe to the pampered pig and ease that feast Growl Tiger's rage. Woe to the bristly bandicoot that lurks on fallen ships. And woe to any cat with whom the tiger came to grips. It's not a huge amount of detail, but it's something. We have the Rotherheis, who live in cottages and seem fairly insulated from Growl Tiger's terror. We have the chicken and goose-keeping people of Hammersmith and Putney, who have an intense fear of him. We have weak canaries, we have pampered Pekingese, and we have bristly bandicoots who live on ships from other countries. And all of this is crammed into only two stanzas. It doesn't take much to give your characters, well, character. Compare that to the Siamese, who are Asian, who sail in Chinese ships, who have blue eyes, and who really want Growl Tiger dead. And that's all we know from the eight stanzas where the Siamese are present. It's not just Growl Tiger's victims who get characterization either. You can't forget that an entire ballad was inserted into the middle of the story, and it's dedicated to a side character. 
The Ballad of Billy McCaw is about a bird who lives in a bar and performs for patrons. That's it. That's his entire character. Despite that, Billy McCaw and even the barmaid Lily the Rose get more characterization individually than the Persians, the Siamese, and all of Growl Tiger's victims combined, and they contribute precisely nothing to the story. All they do is show Growl Tiger being tender and sentimental to offset his inexplicable evil. There was nothing stopping the author from adding a section to the story, exploring the Siamese cats and their culture, and maybe even going into their history with Growl Tiger. Now, to be clear, if he had attempted to write that, it would have also been racist trash, so it's good that he didn't. But all I'm saying is that the potential is there. The reason he didn't give the Siamese cat characterization isn't because there wasn't time or space, but because he didn't want to. He wanted to portray the Siamese cats as a homogenous group, because he's a racist. It's actually really messed up when you consider that the whole of Cats is built on a cast of rich and distinct characters who are cats. Jenny Anydots, Skimbleshanks, Asparagus, Mr. Mistopheles, Grizabella. The author created these characters by imagining, in detail, what a cat's life is like. He has an easier time empathizing with cats than human beings from other cultures. What's strange is that, at first, I thought of the Siamese cats as the heroes in this story. Growl Tiger was obviously evil, and the Siamese cats brought him down. And it's even acknowledged that their actions were a cause of celebration throughout England. So that meant the Siamese cats were good. It was strange that they had so little focus in the story, sure, but they were obviously the heroes. Anyone could see that. It took me a few days to realise that art and bigotry don't work that way. Doing something good isn't the same as being a person, and in the mind of a bigot, being a person matters more than doing good. A salient historical example of this is when Alan Turing was imprisoned for being gay, despite having just won the war against the Nazis by cracking Enigma. Thing is, this isn't just a sad truth about how bigots think. Even if you see the Siamese cats as good, like I do, you're not seeing them as people, because you're viewing them through a piece of art written by someone who doesn't see them as people. Tell me the names of some of the Siamese characters. Tell me where they sailed from in those sampans and the junks. Tell me about where they live, the climate, their houses, or the animals they keep. You can't, no matter how much you might want to, because that information isn't in the lyrics. You don't know anything about them other than what a racist has chosen to tell you. Even if you disagree with it, you have no choice but to see the Siamese cats through the eyes of a racist. No matter what you do, your perception of them is racist. Now, when white people are confronted with incontrovertible proof that something is racist, our impulse is usually to try to justify it. Okay, so the depiction of the Siamese may be racist, but it wasn't because the author was racist, he was, uh, just trying to show us how Growl Tiger, the character, thinks. Um, no he wasn't. The story isn't being told from Growl Tiger's perspective. It's written in the third person, for God's sake. Thing is, even if this story were only racist because it's from Growl Tiger's perspective, that's a condemnation, not a defence. It means the author knew that what he was writing was wrong, yet he chose to do it anyway. It's important to note that Growl Tiger's racism is never criticised or challenged in the story. Just the opposite, there's a verse justifying it. But most to cats of foreign race his hatred had been found. To cats of foreign name and race no quarter was allowed. The Persian and the Siamese regarded him with fear. Because it was the Siamese that mauled his missing ear. So, Growl Tiger is a massive racist, but it's only because a cat of another race bit his ear off. They started it. And the lyrics really are implying that they started it. 
They never give an explanation for why the Siamese cats are so hell-bent on killing Growl Tiger. They never even hint at a motivation. Well, there is actually one small hint. Remember how I said we got a description of the Siamese cat's weapons? Those weapons are specifically described as toasting forks and carving knives. Yeah, apparently they want to eat him? What the fuck? What the actual fuck? How did I miss this? How did everyone else miss this? Why is no one talking about this? The thing is, they never give Growl Tiger a motivation for being an evil bastard who terrorises the people of England. And the motivation for the Siamese cats is a blink and you'll miss it sort of thing. The story isn't big on motivations, so it's interesting. So it's interesting that the author decided to give a clear and obvious justification for Growl Tiger's racism in particular. It's also worth noting that Growl Tiger's violence is never described. The story only makes allusions to Growl Tiger killing people. His violence is sanitized and downplayed. The violence of the Siamese cat, on the other hand, is much more specific and leaves a lifelong mark on Growl Tiger. Speaking of the ear, remember when I said that the Siamese cats are never treated as individuals? That isn't entirely true. The Siamese cat who bit Growl Tiger's ear off is acknowledged as being an individual. Thing is, despite that, Siamese cats as a group are blamed and punished for the actions of this individual, along with Persian cats for some fucking reason. This is never challenged at any point throughout the story. Now, when I initially listened to this song, something felt off to me, but I could never put my finger on it. It wasn't until I came across a blog about the racism in cats while researching for this video that I learned what it was. Michaela, who runs a blog called Confessions of a Chinese-Canadian Drama Queen, pointed out that the song was conflating disparate Asian countries and treating them all as interchangeable. Indeed, the Siamese cats are named for Siam, which is an old name for Thailand, and reference is made to Thailand's capital of Bangkok. But the Siamese cats also sail in Chinese ships and are disparaged with an anti-Chinese slur, yet they're also referred to as a Mongolian horde, but Growl Tiger also conflates them with cats named for Persia, which is the predecessor of Iran. The thing is, I was aware of this on some level, there was a note of confusion tickling at the back of my mind, yet I never consciously realised what was going on. It really showed me how accustomed I am to works of art by white people conflating non-white cultures. Now, something you may not know about Cats is that the lyrics were not written by Andrew Lloyd Webber. The lyrics actually come from a collection of poems by T.S. Eliot. Andrew Lloyd Webber just wrote music for them. So, you know that the words are racist, but is the music okay, since that was written by a different, presumably not racist person? Yeah, no. The music is also racist. Intrinsically. Something you may not know if you haven't studied music, is that it can tell stories. On its own, music has a similar capacity for storytelling that written and visual media do, as long as you know how to interpret it. It doesn't convey the same type of information as written and visual media, but it can carry the same amount. In the context of a musical like Cats, the music may not be telling its own story, but it's using that brilliant capacity for storytelling to add meaning to the lyrics. So it's not just an issue of Andrew Lloyd Webber looking at an overtly racist poem and deciding, yeah, this is great, let's adapt this. He also added his own racism over the top. Something integral to musical interpretation is understanding motifs, which are small pieces of music that represent, well, basically anything. People, places, emotions, intentions, ideologies, you name it. There's this one motif in particular. Sorry, feedy do. This is introduced to us at the end of the last line of the first verse. Rejoicing in his title of the Terror of the Thames. This is, unsurprisingly, the motif for terror. 
and its link to terror is developed and reinforced in subsequent verses. And he scowled upon a hostile world from one forbidding eye. When the rumor ran along the shore, while tigers on the loose, and woke to any cap with him, the tiger came to grips. Now, this motif appears at the end of the first five verses, so that means it's linked to the Siamese cat biting off Growl Tiger's ear. What this motif is saying, in context, is that the Siamese cat biting off Growl Tiger's ear, which, I remind you, Siamese cats and Persian cats as a whole are held personally responsible for, is an act of bloodthirsty terror comparable to Growl Tiger's gleeful pillaging of England. It's saying that the Siamese and Persian cats are just as bad as Growl Tiger. Except it's actually worse than that, because we also have to account for the singer's tone. The human voice has an astonishing capacity for musical expression. Take, for example, this line. Woe to the weak canary that flutters from its feet. He doesn't sing. Woe to the weak canary that fluttered from its cage. He sings, Woe to the weak canary that fluttered from its cage. The way he sings it sounds like woe, and sounds like a bird fluttering. His way of singing reflects the meaning of what he's saying. Now, return to the line about Growl Tiger's ear. Because it was the Siamese that mowed his missing ear. The singer adds a thick layer of venom to that line and only that line. Every other line is much more light-hearted, almost cartoonish. It's only when the Siamese cat hurts Growl Tiger that the violence is framed as properly menacing. While you could interpret this as representing the terrible anger Growl Tiger feels towards the Siamese cat for his missing ear, it's not the most likely interpretation given the racist track record of this song. Especially given that the lyrics frame the Siamese cats as the aggressors in this conflict. No, the music is saying that the Siamese and Persian cats are worse than Growl Tiger. To be clear, I'm not saying that this was an intentional, calculated move by Andrew Lloyd Webber to demonize the Siamese cats. Chances are that Lloyd Webber thought the menacing vibe suited the story and added it for that reason. The question is, why did he feel the vibe was fitting? People will argue that it wasn't racist because Lloyd Webber's hands were tied. He had to use the motif at that point in the song because something something musical structure something. Yet yeah, no, that's bullshit. He could have very easily written something different for that fifth verse that sympathised with the Siamese and Persian cat's perspective. In fact, he already did that for Growl Tiger's victims. Listen to the first half of the third verse. This is not the melody introduced in the first verse. If he had used that melody, this is how it would have sounded. The cottagers of Rotherhithe knew something of his fame. At Hammersmith and Putney people chartered at his name. He could have gotten away with it, but it doesn't work as well as what he decided on, because this verse is from the perspective of Growl Tiger's victims, who aren't supposed to be menacing. He didn't have to connect the Siamese cats to that motif. He could have written different music. He could have also just cut the fucking verse out, seeing as the only thing it contributed to the story was introducing and justifying Growl Tiger's racism. Better yet, maybe if Lloyd Webber didn't decide to take it upon himself as a white person to adapt and promote overtly racist art, he wouldn't have had to find ways to work around the overt racism in the first place. This isn't the only time this motif is sung in a racist way. At the end, after Growl Tiger is dead, there's a verse showing all of his victims celebrating his demise, and it goes like this.
So this is tapping into the stereotype of Asian countries, especially East Asian countries, as authoritarian, obviously. The people of England are celebrating spontaneously, while the people of Bangkok are being commanded to celebrate. But again, Lloyd Webber added to the racism. Not only did he once again connect the motif of terror to these celebrations, implying that the people of Bangkok are being terrorised by their government, but the singers also sang the line in a way that implies authoritarianism. They didn't sing, And a day of celebrations was commanded in Bangkok. They sang, And a day of celebrations was commanded in Bangkok. The singing was reinforced, it was firmly on the beat, and each syllable was disjointed, which are stereotypes of both the military and machines. You don't do this by accident, you have to make a choice. Another major aspect of musical analysis is instrumentation. Now, instrumentation is really complex, and an overview of how it works is completely out of my depth. But one thing I can tell you is that instruments, unsurprisingly, are linked to the culture they come from. Because of that, if you're writing music for a story with characters from another culture, it's probably a good idea to represent them with instruments from that culture if you can. Andrew Lloyd Webber doesn't do this. What he does is… weird. Initially, I was going to write a whole thing about how he does the staccato thing, the one that's so integral to white people's racist stereotyping of East Asian cultures that I don't even need to play it for you to know what the staccato thing is. But I listened to the song again, and I realised he only does that for one line. After that, he switches to this really, really quiet symbol with a tiny bit of bass underneath. Then Lloyd Webber abandons that for... I don't even know. Sang the last duet in danger of their lives. What even is that? Is that an accordion? It's hard to tell because no one plays the accordion like this. He's stereotyping East Asian cultures, no doubt about that. You heard those disgusting mock Chinese accents just as well as I did. Worse than that, though, he's denying them a musical identity. He doesn't even have the good graces to give them a racist and stereotyped one. Growl Tiger gets a rich tapestry of music to represent and develop both his violent and tender sides. He gets brass, he gets strings, he gets woodwind, he gets piano, he gets his own motif. He gets an entire ballad dedicated to a bird bard he happens to like, and the Siamese get nothing. One line of metallophone, one line of cymbals and bass, and a verse of accordion is not musical characterization. And as if that's not bad enough, Lloyd Webber refuses to let his musicians actually play those instruments. It's all crotchets. Why would you do this? It's lazy. If I didn't already know from the rest of the song that Lloyd Webber was a competent composer, I would think that a child wrote this purely because they had to turn something in. It shows that he didn't care enough for the Siamese cats to give them any kind of musical characterization, not even a racist and stereotyped one. Once again, he's taking the racist depersonalization of the Siamese cats that was already in the poem, and he's turning it up to 11. Speaking of characters, Lloyd Webber also intensifies the homogenization. In the poem, Grau Tiger's victims were represented by the narrator, 
But in the song, Lloyd Webber gives most of those lines to individual performers. He lets Growl Tiger's victims represent themselves. The Siamese cats, though? They don't get to be individuals. They're only ever represented by a chorus. That chorus, by the way, is all women. Having women portray East Asian men, I wonder which anti-Asian stereotype that could be perpetuating. It's extremely misogynistic as well. All of the English characters Lloyd Webber created by giving individual singing parts to Growl Tiger's victims are male. He's not just emasculating the East Asian men, but also implying that the English are better than Asians because they're not women. What's particularly gross about this is that most of Andrew Lloyd Webber's racism is a problem of taking racism that was already present in the poem and intensifying it. But this? Lloyd Webber came up with this all by himself. So yeah, that's Growl Tiger's last stand. All I really have left to do is leave a little disclaimer. See, I've noticed that whenever I talk about a topic, I always have a handful of people coming to me for more information because they get the impression that I'm some kind of expert. I'm not. I'm not an expert in general, but certainly not in this case. You have to understand, I didn't notice half of this stuff until I actually started writing the script. It wasn't until I started writing the musical analysis that I fully realised Andrew Lloyd Webber was being racist on purpose, and I didn't originally know he got his lyrics from T.S. Eliot. 50% of this video is a deconstruction of the racism I personally managed to notice in Growl Tiger's Last Stand, but the other 50% is the story of my failure to notice what should have been obvious from the very beginning. I still have a lot to learn, and I will never be an authority on the subject. Hopefully the story of my ignorance has taught you something, but it's in your hands now. Pay attention, think carefully about characters of colour that are written by white people, and most importantly, I cannot emphasise this enough, listen to black, brown, indigenous people of colour not just about racism, but about everything. If Growl Tiger's Last Stand taught us anything, it's that there are too many white people who don't see people of colour as human beings. Not because white people are intrinsically bigoted, but because we grow up in a culture that constantly teaches us that they're not. And that is something we must change. If you got something valuable from this video, please consider becoming a subscriber or patron of Essence of Thought, where most of my work can be found. I didn't want to do the shill at the end of this video, since I didn't want to, you know, benefit from racism, but the algorithm is not being kind to us, and Essence of Thought will soon be Ethel's sole source of income. We would be extremely grateful for any help you can offer, whether that's donations or just shares and likes. Thank you for supporting my family.